My sponsors keep f***ing at me that most of my listeners tune out of this show after the first six seconds, so I gotta hook you quick. And that was a song by my guest. Tonight at this midnight hour, I have in the studio with me George Bush, whose wife went missing when she and a cabal of robotic scientists disappeared inside a gigantic shape-shifting mausoleum. Welcome, George, and I think it's going to turn out fine. Thank you, Peter. I, I'm glad to be here. I think I get what your project is here. It seems like you're trying to make a seamless merge between speculative fiction and like that kind of fiction. I don't, I, I can't think of what it's called. You know, like the boring chore kind of fiction. Thank you, that's very perceptive. Yes, but and so I don't think you're doing a very good job. It seems like the two types you're fooling around with have this uneasy relationship with each other at worst. But at best, they just had, they just don't interact with each other very much. It's just like segment A the host speaks with a psychic alien who drinks the blood of a gigantic cybernetic dungeon. Then segment B the host ponders with unconcealed and gravely terminal narcissism what it means to be a stereotypical version of the person who he really is. I'm just not seeing that merge. It's as if you locked together a wild boar and a wild lion who sometimes bite each other and sometimes ignore each other but never do what you want them to, which is produce a beautiful hybrid creature called a bion via the act of... That will be all of that fancy. Flight of the Fifty Fancies is a proud member of the MPAA and has standards to uphold, and if I were to let you say what you were going to say, it would be gross. Flights of Fancies don't have to go everywhere. And but with all of that out of the way, however, I'd like I'd like to thank you profusely for thinking so hard about my project here and enabling my narcissism thereby. Very few people, George, would expend so much mental battery power thinking about someone else's silly little project, especially since you're not being paid to be here. It's almost as though you're well, nah. And also, I think it's too obvious where you're making stuff up as you go along and where you wrote things down beforehand and you're reading them on the air. It's as clear as the live long day. Can you please just tell the mausoleum story? Gladly. Under one fun condition, that you mask my voice so that no one knows my identitude. Can do. Okay. So just give me a little test thing. This is the sound of my voice. So tell me the story. It was not on a day very unlike today, or tonight, I must say, actually. I kissed my wife goodbye for what is so far the last time, and she walked out the door. I poked at the fire and I read a little bit of my Verlaine. Are you familiar, Mr. Fancy Pants, with the poet Verlaine? No, move on. And... It was not long before my dear wife, the scientist, was missing, and I asked and asked where she may have gone. Oh, and I couldn't find answers anywhere. And yet I searched, and I found my way to the evil cabal that she had become a member of without my knowing. Have you ever been a member of a cabal, Peter? No, but I I thought cabals were for necromancers. You'd be wrong, there are scientific cabals all over the world. But you wouldn't know that. I knew that, sadly. You poor thing is what you should be saying to me. And I found that cabal and I asked them where my wife was and they pointed me to the devil. Where was it or he? If you're asking where the devil was, I will tell you in three words. Or no, five words. In a gigantic, shape-shifting mausoleum. And it shifted from shape to shape. Not as if a were-man or anything like that. But 
just as the were-man becomes the hound, or in some cases a boar, and in some cases even a shark, the shape-shifting mausoleum becomes various different kinds of buildings. Perhaps once in a blue moon, it is the shape of that kind of crypt made popular by the corpse of ancient Mausolus. But then, on a, some other kind of moon, like a harvest moon, it may be the shape of some kind of, like a haunted house looking thing, you know, like with the tower and like, and like the fence on the, on the roof kind of thing, and you could never be sure what it would be when you arrived at the gigantic shape-shifting mausoleum in which dwelt the devil himself. And by the way, for I want to make perfectly clear that this cabal that my wife had become a member of was not any sort of any normal scientific cabal, but it was a robotic scientific cabal, and the scientists had to tear from them their least favorite body part, which in my wife's case, well, you have no business knowing that perv, and, but she had a robotic forehead, and she used that robotic forehead to try to battle the devil in his own mausoleum. Okay, I just want to stop you real quick because I forgot. I wanted to play your other song, which is really... I mean, I like them both, but this... The one... What is the... It's Eval Foswinig or something? That one, I really liked that one. What is that, like Welsh or... Well, it's actually... You can just... You can play it. Thank you very much for this kind of exposure. So good. So, uh, where were we? Well, I kind of just, I know I, you know, I, it's important to talk about your wife and I told, and I'm really, you know, I, this is really important and everything, but I just didn't want to ask you a few questions about like how, how you made that kind of stuff and like how you, why <laughs> you made it. So what do you think? Well, I made it on a program. I mean, I mixed it on this program called Audacity, which is nothing more or less than a free open source digital audio editor and recording computer software application available for Windows, OS X, Linux, other operating systems. Ah, I mean, where were you in the... So you found your... You found the mausoleum and... And then what? Well, and then I went home and started working on my music because it was the only thing that could keep my mind off of my own anguish. Oh, so this is all like tie. So you're tying it in here. Yeah, if you call it whatever you please. But the fact is, it was my music that brought my wife back to me. Before you see, the two of us were had understood about shape-shifting in general and the buildings that shift their shape in particular and we came upon this mausoleum she was inside unfortunately trapped within 
but I put on my rock and roll tracks, and the mausoleum became a hovel, finally the cabal of evil, about which I told you a great deal before, the scientists, the cybernetic scientists of evil, approached the mausoleum, which unfortunately soon destroyed many of them by becoming a gigantic skyscraper that was much, much greater in area than the mausoleum or the hovel that it became as well. All it did to defend itself and its walls from our girding was embiggen and debiggen as it needed to to crush us under its foundations. Its newly built foundations. Revolted, I retreated and I returned to my basement where I made more and more horrible little rock and rolls. Finally, the number of rock and rolls that I had produced had become so wide that I couldn't fit it through my door frame. I'm just kidding around. I'm being I'm being silly to mask this, the anguish that I have even in thinking about this story, but I did make a very wide number indeed of pleasant little musics, two of which you so generously played for your widely numbered audience. Yeah, very funny. So what's, come on, you know, what happened here? It seems like your wife is back. What's her name, by the way? Her name is Laura, and she, and after all the children of the cabal had been dealt with by the mausoleum, which had become for just a moment a gigantic church, a gigantic spidery church that mushed the members of the cabal one by one with its flying buttresses. It was repulsive, and I wrote a song about the event whose name is so vile it would ruin your relationship with the MPAA, and I am a I am good boy, so I shall not repeat it here. However, I was so pleased to find that my wife returned triumphantly with her bleeping, blooping, robotic forehead, which she used to decapitate the devil. And now he is dead. Wow, that's actually really great news, I think. Or maybe it's not. Yeah, it's kind of hard to say. But in any case, his reign of terror is at an end. And you know what we did with the head of the the devil. How many guesses do I get? <laughs> you get zero because I'm going to tell you we jellied it and ate it for our supper, and then we went to bed, had very interesting dreams all night long, and breakfasted upon the jellied head of the delicious dark angel, subterranean style angel. And we wrote a recipe book about it, which you will not be able to purchase, because we wrote it on vellum, in bat ink. And what's bat ink? MPAA problem. I'll tell you later, but I can't. You understand? I'm just, I'm just trying to obey. But all you have to do is boil the head for ten hours in a pot outdoors for the steam that erupts from the boiling is not as pleasant as you might imagine. Especially because it's mostly smoke. None of this is actually surprising. I'm sure I'm, if you hadn't told me to put it outside, I probably would have just thought of that myself. Yes, and the only thing that we had to do was remove the sloppy bones. The sloppy bones which were composed of the horn-encrusted skull, the horn-encrusted topmost vertebra and the second topmost vertebra which was encrusted 
in so many horns that we almost lost our minds. And yet the flavor of the meat and of the brain and of the cheeks and the jowls and the sinews were all jellied. Wait, the, did you say the taste were, was jellied? Well, it's very, very difficult to explain to a layman, and I seriously emphasize lame men. But if you ever find the head of a devil, all of whom are now unemployed, thanks to my wife Laura and her excellent marksmanship with that wonderful cyber forehead of hers. Can you tell me what it does? That would be breaking the scientist's code, and so of course I think I think that should answer your question. Thanks, George, and thank Laura for me. So we're gonna sign you off with with what you're, the song you played that finally crumbled the mausoleum. Thank you, that's perfect. My phone's been ringing off the hook with all these text messages. This one that I got, I got too many to pick, but I got one by this guy named Stefan Anniker. I think he's he's Swiss born, and he he's been translating this kind of like wild sort of uh, something. I don't know. It's a tract pamphlet or something, and he says. Dear Peter, you, what do you think about these four texts? I just translated them from this guy named Vasu Bandhu, who uh, flourished in 5th century India. 4th or 5th, anyway, so it says, it starts, text 5. The exemplification is the specific indication of the connection of the two, event and event associate when one is attempting to demonstrate something. The connection is the invariable concomitance of the demonstrandum and the demonstrator, that is, the non-arising of the demonstrator when the demonstrandum does not exist, that through which the connection, i.e. invariable concomitance, of two is specifically mentioned is called the exemplification. It must take the form of a specific parallel example plus the statement of an invariable concomitance. Thus, in the inference regarding sounds of speech, a specific parallel example would be like a pot. Sounds of speech are non-eternal because of their state of arising due to an effort, like a pot. And the statement of the invariable concomitants would be, whatever has come about through an effort is not eternal. Among pseudo-justifications, there are 1. Those which are not demonstrated, 2. Those which are not sufficiently certain, and 3. Those which incur a self-contradiction. Among these, those which are not demonstrated are those where the characteristics stated in the exemplification do not exist. For example, if it is said, sound is non-eternal because it is perceived by the eye, this is an argument which is not demonstrated. If it is said, it is eternal because it is without a body, this is an argument which is not sufficiently certain. An example of one which incurs self-contradiction for a Vaisha Sika is, it is not eternal because it is perceived through the senses. For a sankhya, the effect is contained in the cause because it comes to be through the cause. End note. According to the Vaisha Sikas, simple entities are eternal, though they may be perceived by the senses. According to sankhya, effects pre-exist in their causes, and they are not a new creation, 
but only an explicit manifestation of that which is implicitly contained in the material cause. So the Sankhya may assert the first half of the statement given, but not the second, since the effect, strictly speaking, does not come about because of the cause. Inconsistency with one's own unstated theses is not an extra-logical ground for rejecting an argument in Vasubandhu's method. Return to text. There is a flaw in the exemplification if it exists with an undemonstrated object. For instance, if it is stated that sound is eternal because of its non-tangibility, like a cognition, not like a pot. The object which is to be demonstrated and the demonstrator is not demonstrated by stating the negative parallel example like a pot. So I just want to thank Stefan Anneker for what he's doing. I'm sure it's so hard to translate all that Sanskrit. No, seriously, that's that's really cool. So keep it up. If you ever have anything else to send me, Mr. Anneker, I'd be really happy to read it. Just uh, make sure it's make sure it's G-rated. So have a spooky night.